All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm back with another one. So as you guys know, being locked up, sometimes things happen. They slam you down. Some people try to get crazy. And the next thing you know, you're on lockdown. So unfortunately, yesterday, my boy wasn't able to tap in. So we're behind a day. So there might be a day or two where I'm not able to put one of these stories up. However, I'm back with this banger right here. This one's a good one. It kind of shows you, you know, what was happening when these guys all first got out of the shoot program, when they let everybody out again, right after the Todd Asker, Danny Troxel civil suit, when they opened up the floodgates from the shoot program and everybody came out. Now, this situation right here, it happened in Pelican Bay level four. Now, again, in one of the other stories, I kind of talked a little bit about this, but, you know, as you guys can just imagine, especially those of you that have done time. Just kind of imagine how things must have been for those guys out there when they came out of the shoot program. Some of these guys have been back there in the shoot program for 10, 20, 15, 30 years. You know, there was a couple of guys that I knew back there that had been back there for close to 35 years. Kurt Turflinger, one of the ABs, part of their, their old leadership was one of them. He was my neighbor up there. He'd been back there so, close to something like 35 years or something like that. But these guys, you know, they just get out. They're, they're used to being back there in the shoe program, not having nothing. They get out, they have all these privileges, but that's only one part of it. The other part of it is just being out there, being free again. A lot of these guys, aside from dealing with, you know, not knowing really how the other side is going to react once you get out there, even though you know that leadership is in, you know, the process of, of having these talks behind the scenes, that these guys were anticipating going out back out to the main lines that leadership in the short corridor were in the process of having these talks, these peace talks. There, you know, this this was reverberating throughout the shoot program. Everybody heard about it. Everybody knew that you know there was a good chance that this lawsuit was gonna, you know, that they were gonna win. It gained traction. It was going through the courts. It started to look good. People started talking about it. What if? What if we really do make it back out there? What's gonna happen? Is this real or is it not real? Does somebody have an agenda? Is this just a way to, you know, to get everybody back out there, put everybody in place, and then, you know, just go ahead and, and blindside somebody? Or is this real? Nobody really knew 100%. Nobody. Even the guys that were back there, you know, talking about establishing this agreement to end hostilities. You know, you got to look at it from this perspective. You know, you're talking to the opposition. And even though, you know, you, you guys are talking about entering into this agreement to end hostilities, you know, that you got some some crafty individuals. You got some savvy, you know, some savvy characters back there that might just be, you know, talking the talk, walking the walk just to play somebody out of pocket. So, you know, everything is looking like it's real, but nobody really knew. So these guys get out there, you know, everybody starts getting funneled to the yard. They start letting them out. You know, little bit, little by little, they had a process that, you know, that they were using to, to let these guys out. And, you know, everybody's just kind of, it's awkward. Everybody's just kind of feeling each other out, you know, watching each other. Everybody is wondering, like, what's going to happen? So this is just one part of it, though. You guys got to understand that a lot of these guys had cabin fever. <clears throat> I know what it is because I went through it myself. You know, every time I used to get out of the shoot program and I would hit the streets, I would have to go through this transition, this transitional period where, you know, it was just hard for me to adapt to being back out there in society. I didn't know how to act. I didn't know how to be around people. The small things that you take for granted, the everyday things like going to a store, you know, you and your lady going to a restaurant or whatever it was, going to DMV, trying to get your license. I didn't know how to act. I was full of anxiety. So the first day I get out, I'm trying to watch everything that's moving, all the different colors, all the different people that are moving, cars, birds. And it was like, it was almost like overload. I had to get, you know, I had to go to a, a, a liquor store, get a 40 ounce, slide into an alley and just, just down that shit. And I had to decompress. If I ever had an anxiety attack, it was probably at that at that moment right there. You know, I didn't know how to do the, the the everyday normal things. I would go into a store, like a grocery store or liquor store, and I'd stand in line, and literally, I felt out of place. I felt awkward. And I know some of you know what I'm talking about, because I've talked to a lot of other people that have done time like that. And it's not just regular time. It's 
that kind of time where you're locked up in the shoot program, that long term solitary confinement where you're by yourself. You got to find ways to keep yourself occupied. Literally, I used to. You guys can laugh all you want, but I used to, you know, sometimes I would talk to myself. Sometimes I would entertain myself. I wouldn't answer myself, but, you know, you had to find a way to get through the time back there. Find a way to keep your mind strong. And, you know, you're used to being by yourself. A lot of the times, you you, you know, you, you develop different kind of characteristics like, you know, being antisocial. And then there's other things like PTSD. And then you got, you know, guys that get schizophrenia paranoia, things like that. So, you know, they're also dealing with that. There's a lot of individuals that got out of the shoot program that went out to those yards and they were dealing with the same type of issues that I had to deal with, except they had to deal with them in prison. Ooh, and that's, I can just imagine how that was. You know, I, I've heard stories about some of these guys that have been back there for years. They got out to these main lines and, you know, paranoia started sinking in. They started thinking that people were plotting on them, especially some of these guys that were leaders. Kurt Turflinger or Rick Turflinger, that was an AB that I mentioned a minute ago. He was one of them. He got out. He didn't, as far as I know, some people were saying that he got a hold of some meth out there. He used it. He freaked out. And then he just locked it up. But, you know, other people that were out there told me that, you know, he got out. He was lost. He was lost. And because who he was, he's out there with, you know, Africanos and, and you know, they're going through some other type of shit. They're, they're going through those racial, you know, those racial type of things. And I guess he felt like, you know, he couldn't program out there and it, it got overwhelming to him and he, he ended up checking out. So, you know, they're going through those types of things. The other thing is, like I said, you got different people out there, different kind of characters out there that were doubting whether or not this was legit. You have, you, you got to look at it like this. You got some cats that been through the wars. These are the older dudes. They've been through the wars. They've been through the shoe wars. They were out there on the, on these lines when, you know, the war was, was probably at its peak. And these are the guys that, you know, th they're probably the biggest skeptics. They're the ones that are like, man, there's too much blood that, that have been spilled over the years for this to be legit. I don't believe it's true. I believe that we're going to get back out there everybody's going to get their their guys in place and then it's going to be free for all it's going to be a war and then you got you got these youngsters that you know and there's a difference you know this is the difference between Northanios and Sureños so Sureños out there in southern california they're not dealing with Northanios on the streets so a lot of them have never even been around Northanios a lot of them have just heard about Northanios but, you know, you got a lot of Northanios, the youngsters that come from the streets and they're used to or they're accustomed to, to you know, going at it with the upstaters. So th this is another group of individuals that, you know, you got to keep a, a close eye on these guys as well. Then you got a, a lot of youngsters that they're green. They just, you know, this is their first time or, you know, they're still they're still learning. And those are probably the ones that are a lot more manageable than the, than the others. But you got different levels of different guys that, you know, have different ways of looking at this. So that's another thing that they're all dealing with. So just imagine, too, you know, the guys that have been back there in the shoot program that have heard names of like, you know, high level Mexican mafia members or, you know, them hearing about high level NF members. And imagine hearing about these guys over the years and you being educated, you hearing the history, and these guys are supposed to be mortal enemies. Now you get out there and you see them walking by with, you know, two or three other Mexican mafia members. That's a lot to take in right there. So, you know, all this is going on out there on the yard. And, you know, at that time, Chato from Maravilla was out there. Chato from Maravilla, an individual that I know personally, I was with him in San Quentin, he was on death row. This is somebody, I believe he got his sentence, his, his death penalty overturned. He got his, his sentence commuted to life in prison. But he's somebody that I know personally. I was over there with him in the adjustment center, stand up dude. Solid individual is about as solid as they come. You know, I remember a while back, one of the viewers asked me in one of the Q and A's who, who I thought was one of the most dangerous Mexican mafia members alive right now that was still active. And I said, Chato from Maravilla. I know him, trust me. I know his history. I know things that he's done in the past. He's a stand-up type of individual. And he's somebody that's known throughout the system. So Chato's there in Pelican Bay. He's got this yard. 
Now, for the North Daniels, there's a young C, a young NF member named Monster from Tulare County. I don't know. This is somebody that probably came years after, you know, I was already gone, but he's young. And everything that I've heard about him is he's a young C that took his education serious and he's somebody that took his commitment serious. So he's out there for the North Daniels and both of these guys are trying to establish the yard. You know, everything's going on. You can imagine it was probably chaotic at first. They're trying to establish these policies, implement some type of semblance and, and harmony out there on the yard. They're, they're trying to watch their people, supervise everything that's going on out there. Then their security, they got to they gotta worry about. So there's a lot going on out there at that time. So for the first month, everybody was out there on the yard. You know, after a while, probably after everything kind of calmed down, then people, you know, they probably started doing their regular routine, you know, going to work, staying in their cell sometime throughout the day while your celly went out, got his yard time. You guys alternated to give each other that you know, a little bit of, you know, privacy time, some free time by yourself. But during this first month, everybody was out there on the yard. It was thick out there because everybody was kind of just sitting back, just watching the show. You know, I, I heard that these guys, a lot of the Sureños were, you know, just kicking it on one side and a lot of North Daniels were kicking it in their little area and they were just kind of watching these leaders. You know, it was a spectacle to watch them, go to the middle of the yard, shake hands, call each other, carna, you know, and have their talks with their, their entourages and their details. That's another thing. So apparently, you know, these, these, these entourages or these, these modern day bodyguards, whatever you guys want to call them. So for the Mexican mafia, apparently they called them entourages. They had an entourage with them. The leaders, all the leaders had entourages with them. The Nuestra Familia members, they called those they called them details. So there was a distinction there. They Each one of them had a label for it, but that's what they used to call it. So these guys are out there watching, you know, their details and their entourages. And, and you know, the, these guys are going to the middle of the yard. They're talking. Everybody's wondering if it's going to kick off right there. They're watching hand movements, body, body language, all that. So eventually it starts to, you know, starts to everything kind of just simmers out. You know, they, they develop some type of semblance out there. They get their, you know, their policies in order and everybody starts to program. Everything's kind of just, you know, it's calming down now. That awkwardness is slowly fading away. And there's some trust that, that's been built. We've been out here for a couple of weeks now. Nothing's happening. You know, maybe it is real. Maybe, maybe nothing's going to happen. There was a weeding out process. A lot of dudes were pushing back. A lot of the dudes that did not, you know, agree with being out there. The ones that were more vocal about it, they were getting taken out. Then you had, you know, a house cleaning detail that went on for a while. Guys that, I told you guys in one of the previous stories that for like the, you know, the, I don't know how long, maybe the first month, maybe the first two months, they were pulling everybody's paperwork all over again. It was like you had to get cleared all over again. They wanted to know where you've been, where you were at, you know, why you were in prison. So you basically had to go through a clearance process all over again. Everybody did. They wanted to know if anybody had slipped through the cracks. So once they did all that and they started the program, you know, the main thing that they were trying to establish out there, the main line that both Monster and Chato were trying to push was respect. You know, I, I don't have nobody telling me the story from the NF side. So I can only speculate about what was being talked about. But from, you know, the, the Sureño side, the things that were being conveyed were, you know, you guys show them their respect. The mad dogging and all that, you know, throwing up sets and, and set tripping and all that, the lines, all that is out. As far as their big homies, they get the same respect, the same respect that we demand they get that same respect. They're big homies, the NF members. You guys address them with respect. If they talk to you or you're talking to them, look them in the eye. You know, give them that same respect that you give us, the carnales, the the you know, the big homies. So that was something that they that they pushed real hard across the board was that that common respect. You know, everybody was being accountable for how you know they conducted themselves out there. 
And that was something that everybody had to be conscious of. You couldn't treat, you know, the Southerners like you treated the North Daniels as far as like, you know, to a point to where you you felt comfortable enough to start playing with them on, on some level. Maybe after a while, maybe they did. But I'm talking about in the beginning when it was still kind of awkward. You know, you had to really go out of your way to show that you were giving that respect. And it was, you know, it was coming from both sides. Now, with respects to the, the detail and the entourages, now, there was one exception to that rule. When the leaders would be walking around on the yard, that's when these guys would be flocked around these guys, and, and that's when they'd be tasked with, you know, basically keeping security on them. So the only time that, you know, the entourages or, or the, the details, the only exception to the rule or the only time that they kind of like loosened up a little bit where there was like a little bit of, you know, a neutral, there was some neutral ground was when they participated in some type of sports activities together, whether it was basketball, handball, softball, they were out on the, you know, soccer field playing uh, soccer together or and I even heard, you know, stories about them busting down together, working out together, doing the rutina and the, the machina together. So whenever they would participate in these, these activities and they would be interacting, the entourages and the, the details would kind of fall back. There would be some type of neutral ground where they'd be kind of like right there in close proximity. But for the most part, they would fall back. You know, because this guy's playing basketball, you can't have eight dudes right there, you know, surrounded you, surrounding you while you're playing basketball. So that's when they kind of like fell back and, you know, stayed on the sideline. So, again, you know, these guys that that were out there trying to adjust, a lot of them were able to go back out there and just straight jump right back into it. But a lot I want to say it's probably like a lot of the older guys that have been down for a long time. Those are the ones that. You know, it it took them at least it took me a month every time to transition back out to the streets. But these guys, you know, they probably took them like a month. They came out looking like a piece of chalk. They're pale. They're walking around zombied out. So, you know, it took them a while before that that awkwardness started to go away. I know it did for me every time it took me like a good a good solid month before I was able to go into a store or into a restaurant with my lady and not feel like, you know, like I just wanted to get up and walk out, you know, literally get up out of the restaurant and, and walk outside. My palms will start sweating. And, you know, me, myself, when whenever I get uncomfortable, I don't know how to deal with being uncomfortable. If I catch somebody looking at me and I start to feel uncomfortable, the only thing I know how to do is turn to aggression. And a lot of these guys were probably dealing with it the same way. So you can imagine again, you know, these guys being good leaders, them knowing this, that, you know, there's a lot of different things that they had to stay on top of. So like I said, for like the first month, both of these guys, they're out there on the yard, they're implementing their policies, you know, they're going, as they go along, they're kind of filling everything out. They're trying to get a feel of each other, how they run, you know, the yard for their people. And this probably takes place for about a good month. So like after about a month, they're out there playing sports together. You know, they're out there, guys that knew how to tattoo or tattooing on each other, Northerners and Southerners. And, you know, as time went on, they got more comfortable. They start throwing spreads. And before you know it, I got your back. You got my back. Anything kicks off. We got you. So, you know, it went beyond just an agreement to end hostilities. In the beginning, that's what it was supposed to be about. But this transcended to you know different territory it went well above and beyond this was like some you know this is like some real rasa type of shit you know now they're like you know what we're one car and as as far as you know as far as i know and the things that i was hearing there was not supposed to be no lines out there there wasn't supposed to be like nor north south the labels, they were letting go of all that stuff. You know, there's not supposed to be no Sureños or not supposed to be no Norteños. We're all Rasa and we're all out here functioning and programming together. These are things that I'm sure, you know, some of the visionaries back in the day, Cheyenne or even old man Rafa, would probably, they're probably rolling in their graves right now. Like, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I always envisioned it to be, the super game, the Rasa coming together. It's crazy when you think about it and when you put it in perspective.
So one of the other things that was commonly done, not, not just on this yard, but on other yards as well. And this is something that I heard, you know, from several different people in different prisons was that like every, every morning or whatever, whatever designated time of the day that they, that they set, you would get the two leaders will come out there or, you know, leadership, maybe three carnales from both the NF and, you know, the Mexican mafia would come out to the yard and they'd be out there and they'd be chopping it up. And the whole purpose of that, that meeting was to make sure that, you know, everything was being ran above board, that there was no issues. You know, if there was any type of issues where somebody was looking at somebody crazy or somebody was striking up some graffiti, their hood somewhere. And, you know, that's a form of disrespect. You know, when somebody strikes their hood up on, on a bench or, you know, on a wall somewhere, you know, I don't want to see that shit. You know what I mean? I go into the visiting room. My family don't want to see that shit. So it's those type of things right there. They're small. They're petty, but they escalate. They have, you know, those types of things can, can turn into full blown wars because, you know, you see a Sureño or Norteño going out there striking up their hood and. You know, you get somebody that want to jam them up. They like, you know, why are you doing that shit? That shit ain't necessary. I mean, what's, what are you trying to say? You know what I mean? So they would meet, they would convene out there on the yard at some designated set time. And again, they'd be out there and, you know, they talk about everything that was going on, how the yard was running, who was doing what. And, you know, one of the things that I've heard other people say, several different people, too, is that, you know, the, the NF members and the Mexican Mafia members were calling each other carnal. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, maybe they wanted, well, I even heard about that. I was going to say maybe they wanted it to become one organization. You know, I've heard rumors that they were even talking about some type of, some type of tattoo that, it was a tattoo that represented both sides and that they were encouraging each other to get this tattoo. I've never seen it, never, you know, got anything concrete on it. I've just heard the rumors about it. But in light of everything else that, that I've heard and everything else that I've seen going on out there, I believe it. Anyway, so again, you know, their, their main thing was to, was to continue to push that respect on both sides of the aisle. That was the most important thing because... You got a lot of youngsters and a lot of individuals with different perspectives, different kind of personalities. You know, they look at things different and, you know, they had to know that the main thing out there was respect. Because if there's respect and it's extended and they're extending their best hand, then nine times out of 10, there's not going to be no issues. So that was the one main thing that they continue to push. And like I said, Monster was probably pushing the same thing with the North Daniels. You know, you guys ever address one of those Air Meadows? You guys do it with the utmost respect. You look him in the eye, you give him his respect, you know, the same way you would respect one of our big homies. You extend that same respect back to them. So like I said, you know, one of the things that these guys started doing out there on the yard was to interact on some level and play sports, whether it was handball, basketball, soccer, whatever it was out there, machina. But during these activities right here, this was, you know, the most important this was probably the most important function out there that they needed to understand that respect had to be given on all levels because, you know, you're out there and the competitive juices are flowing and you're in a competitive game where nobody wants to lose. It's not that serious, but you try telling that to somebody that's that thinks they got a good basketball game that thinks that they, you know, that they can take you in the paint and just, you know, I mean, run circles around you. Same thing on the handball court. You get guys that are out there and they think that they got good game and those competitive juices start flowing and you don't want to lose, especially to somebody that's an adversary. Because even though they're respecting those lines, it's still, you know, they're still thinking about it. Hey, this this is this is Sureño or hey, this this is Norteño, you know, so I'm not gonna lose to a Norteño out here in front of the fellas. So I guess Monster was him being younger, he was somebody that, you know. He used to always be on the handball court. He'd always be out there on the handball court. And, you know, from everything I heard, he had a good handball game. He was young and he had a game like your boy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he supposedly he had a good handball game. He had a good kill shot like me. <laughs> I used to have one. I don't know about now. So, you know, he's out there, and a lot of the time the Sureños are out there. They they always were out there playing handball. And on this particular day, Monster's out there playing handball, and he's running the court. 
He's beating everybody out there. And there's a Sureño out there that he's always on the handball court, thinks he's got good game. And at one point, him and Monster start playing. Well, Monster starts winning the game. He starts winning and apparently, you know, at the end of the game. So anyways, it's the last point and Monster hits a kill shot, kills the game and game over. Sureño's pissed off. He's pissed off. He's a little young, younger, you know, so he's a youngster and he's probably a little bit, you know, a little bit not as disciplined as an older guy would be. He gets a little upset and instead of, you know, extending his best hand, shaking Monster's hand, hey, hey, I'm good game, bro. You know what I mean? Good game. Win, lose, or draw, you're supposed to shake somebody's hand, show good sportsmanship, but he didn't do that. You know, he got mad and he was just kind of like, ah, and threw the handball at Monster. He didn't really throw it at him, like aggressively throw it at him, but he threw, at, he threw it at him with just a little bit more enthusiasm than he needed to, enough to know that, hey, you're in violation for doing that. So, you know, when that happened, Monster obviously took it as disrespect. And I'm not going to say, you know, he wanted to go start some shit, but he went and he approached Chavo. And he was probably like, hey, you know what? You know, when they had their their daily get together, or whatever, he probably told Chato, hey, check it out, man. I was on the handball court yesterday or whatever. And one of your little homies, little youngster, I was, you know, I was beating him down. Huh. I, th I, you know, I, I hit a kill shot, cold kill shot, beat him. And, you know, he threw the handball at me. And it was, it was disrespectful. You know, for the most part, I probably could have just let it go. But, you know, I had some homies that were there and they were watching. And that, that sends out the wrong message, man. So whenever something like that happens, we need to kill it. We need to nip the bud right there so that it doesn't happen. So Chato's like, you know what? I'll take care of it. I'll make sure it gets addressed. Don't trip. I got you, man. So Chato's living. You know, me knowing Chato, I can imagine <laughs> he probably was like, you know, He's probably mad that this youngster disrespected Monster, but he was probably more upset with the fact that he defied his authority. I told you, cats, to extend these guys with, with respect, especially when you're dealing with their big homies, not to be disrespecting them. That's the main thing that I've been pushing out here, the main thing I've been telling you guys. So what Chato does is he goes over there and, you know, he knows who to look for. Stomper from Anaheim. He's somebody that you guys just heard a story about. He's out there on the yard and he's somebody that's part of Chato's, you know, he's probably part of his, his chain of command or part of his leadership on some level. He knows that, you know, Stomper's the one to get at whenever there's issues out there on the yards. So he locates Stomper and, you know, he addresses it. He's like, hey, what happened? What happened on the yard? What happened on the handball court? Who threw that, who threw that handball at, at Monster? The one thing I the one thing I forgot to tell you guys is that at that time the Stomper was also another reason why Chato probably approached Stomper is because Stomper was also somebody that was always on the handball court. And Stomper was also somebody that supposedly at that time he also had like a good handball game. He was one of the best on the yard as far as the Sureños. But this was before they shot Stomper in that story I told you guys about. When they shot him in the leg, it killed his handball game, took him out of commission. And from that point on, he never again was able to play handball. But that's probably another reason why Chato approached him. So Chato goes out there. He jams up Stomper. Hey, what happened on the handball court? Who threw the ball at, at Monster? Who disrespected him? And even though he's addressing Stomper, he's addressing all of them. So Stomper's like, um, you know, he don't really say nothing, which, of course, he's not going to say nothing. He's not going to throw one of his homies under the bus. He's kind of just waiting for somebody else to speak up crickets nobody says nothing so chato's like okay you're not gonna tell me he goes that's cool i respect that but since nobody's gonna say nothing he goes so all you guys are gonna be on concrete from this point on and you're gonna stay on concrete until further notice until i take you off and then he said and then furthermore every last one of you that are on this handball court are gonna apologize to monster you guys are all gonna apologize to him and I don't want to see none of you on this handball court until I tell you you can play handball again. So now Stomper's pissed. Stomper's pissed. These other Sureños are all pissed. They're all mad now. You know, they're all mad. And that's basically how it got handled. So for those of you that 
didn't see the other story or for those of you that don't know what concrete means what concrete means is that basically that's their terminology for saying that it basically means you're going to be doing burpees on the yard from dusk till dawn all day out there if you're not working you're not doing something that you know something that you have to do going to school or working you're going to be out there busting down it's the same thing with us you know when somebody gets dp they get disciplined they get made to go into the corner and do burpees in the cat shit <laughs> so this was you know their way of of dp'ing these guys so they're out there no telling for how long a week maybe two weeks they're losing weight burning calories they all got bruce lee bodies out there and they're all pissed off and at one point stomper approaches he approaches chato and he's like chato check it out man he's like i got a personal issue with somebody and i need to i need to get it off my chest i need to handle it you know i'm, I'm coming and i'm asking you for your blessings i don't know exactly how he communicated it to chato but however he communicated it to Chato, the nod and the wink, or somehow, some way he told him that it was the guy that didn't speak up that threw the handball at Monster. That's what he was saying. Because Stomper was upset, and a lot of the other Suranios was upset because although Stomper wasn't going to throw him under the bus, he was waiting for the individual that threw that handball to go ahead and speak up, to own his own shit, to say, hey, hey, Chato. Hey, it was me. I'm the one that threw the ball. You know, these other guys, they don't deserve to get DP. You know, it was me. I'm the one that did it. So, you know, I'll go ahead and take whatever licks I got coming. But he didn't do that. Like I said, it was crickets. He just, he didn't say nothing. I don't know if he was young and, you know, he was scared of the repercussions. He was scared of the consequences, but he let all his boys go down with him. So Stomper got the green light to go ahead and take care of this individual. And that's what he did. So Stomper, you know, at, at one point he goes out there to this individual and everybody's already mad at this guy because they're already, they, they let it be known that they're upset with him. I'm sure some of them probably even confronted this dude and probably told him, hey, bro, why the fuck you didn't speak up? Why didn't you say something, man? You know what I'm saying? You're supposed to take accountability for your own shit, but you got us all, you know, on concrete status for what you did. So Stomper, he goes out to the yard, and at some point, he starts, he gets with this dude. He sees him, he rushes him, they start throwing blows. Bing, bop, 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 bop. You don't go at him with the perazzo, it's nothing like that, it's not that serious. He just goes at him with straight fisticuffs. So he's on this dude, he's on his helmet. Bing, bop, 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 bop. <laughs> so they're going at it, and this guy's bunky jumps in to back up his, his bunky. You know, that's that's common. It's common. A lot of the times, regardless of the, the consequences, if you got a celly and you guys bond and, you know, your celly gets jumped on, sometimes guys have a brain, you know, they, they, they're not thinking. They just see that their celly's getting jumped on and they jump in and they back them up. Who knows what happened? Or maybe he just didn't care about the consequences. Maybe he thought, you know, Stomper was doing something he wasn't supposed. I don't know. But he jumped in. That caused somebody else to jump in. Now, before you know it, you got a four on five. It's a full, you know, it's a small little melee. But they're throwing chingasos. Bing, bah, bah, bing, bah, bing, bah, bah, bah. You see boots flying everywhere, socks flying off and shit, right? <laughs> so at one point, they put the yard down. They put the yard down. And so wherever these guys, wherever they fought at, you know, it happened like that. It probably happened within 30 seconds. It probably happened. And it was probably over. It happened. Maybe they were in a blind spot. Maybe they were in the gym. I don't know. But wherever wherever it happened, they got away with it. They didn't even get caught. So they're all out there. They're still on the yard. And, you know, when it when, when it's all said and done, Chato finds out about, you know, these other cats that backed up this individual that didn't speak up, that didn't address it. And all four of them ended up getting rolled up. They got rolled up and taken off the yard. They got basically they got deemed no good. For doing what they did but that right there you know that set the precedent but you know the other thing about this this situation though is that you know a lot of the sureños that were out there on the yard with this when this all kicked off apparently from what you know my guy told me a lot of them were pissed off a lot of them were upset because they felt like it shouldn't have went that far 
that, you know, Chato maybe should have told Monster, hey, I'll take care of it. It won't happen again. Spencer, you know what I'm saying? I apologize. I mean, come on, he threw a handball with, a, you know, a little bit more aggression than he should have. And that turned into, you know, everything that happened from that point on. So they felt like, you know what, all this happened. We had to go apologize to, to Monster. You know, that right there in itself, I'm sure, it's, it, you know, those guys had to humble themselves to go do something like that. I mean, I remember hearing a situation like that that happened with Skip and, you know, a situation even happened like that with me and Susanville where, you know, somebody got disrespected and then you got somebody else that was a little bit more aggressive that pulled somebody with influence over from, you know, the Sureños, one of their one of their leaders and told him, hey, you know, your homeboy disrespected my homeboy and, you know, he needs to come apologize. And that's not going to happen. That led to a full out brawl because making your people go apologize to somebody else. I mean, just imagine how they must have felt. But, you know, Chato felt like a precedent needed to be set right here. And maybe he felt like if this happens, you know, it's going to stop it from happening again. Once those four individuals got rolled up, Chato addressed, you know, everybody else that was on concrete status. And he told them, look, you guys are off. You guys can resume your handball. You know, you guys can play handball now. But I don't ever want to hear about nothing like this ever happening again. I told you guys the main thing out here is respect. And if you guys can't play handball, basketball, soccer, whatever kind of sports out here and conduct yourselves, you know, appropriately, if you guys can't control, you know, the competitive juices and extend respect when you lose and, and show good sportsmanship, then don't even go out there because you're going to set yourself up. And when it happens, you're going to, you know, the same thing is going to happen to you that happened to these other guys. So let that be a lesson to you guys. Anyway, that's the story right there. You know, there was a lot of tension going on while this was all happening because, like I told you guys, there were a lot of Northerners that seen what happened. And I'm sure that kind of that kind of brought everything up a couple notches. They're wondering, like, well, is this going to be the one thing that's going to spark that keg and is going to kick off the whole yard? And it's always the little things like that that do. Somebody looking at each other, you know, crazy, mad dogging, trying to eye fuck each other. Somebody bumping into somebody, not saying nothing. Somebody feeling disrespected. It's always the little things like that that escalate. So I'm sure that while all this was going on, a lot of these guys were probably just, you know, again, laying back like, what's going to happen? Is this going to lead to something bigger? But it caused a lot of tension out there for a minute, for a brief minute, because everybody was waiting to see what was going to happen. You know, they're probably like, is, are these guys going to apologize to monster or what's going to come of it? Is it going to escalate? Is it going to turn into something else? Who knows? But it caused some tension. And in those type of situations, it has the potential of, you know, getting blown out of proportion. You know, the other thing that I think about when I hear, when I heard this story is Chato going above and beyond probably what he needed to do in order to you know, resolve this issue, but this is the same kind of shit that the NF was doing out there in some of the other yards. When I used to talk to Baby Joker, Baby Joker was telling me about NF members, righteous NF members that had spent 20 years back there in the shoe program. Guys that were, were straight, dedicated, solid hitters that were out there on these yards. And whenever some, some type of conflict would come up where you know, there'd be a Mexican mafia member out there that didn't like something. Well, I'm going to tell you guys the specific incident that I was talking about. So there was supposedly there's a Mexican mafia member that was on one of these other yards. And I'm not going to mention who he was. It's not important. But what ended up happening was, is I guess one of the NF members that was out there on that same yard was selling a little bit of dope. He was hitting and, you know, he was trying to get his money. So there was a couple of Sureños out there that liked the way he was doing business. They probably, you know, they were probably they probably linked up. They were in the same building or something or whatever. They interact. So at some point, you know, he's probably like, hey, I, I got a little something. I'm slinging it. And they're probably like, hey, we could probably dump it. You know, let's, let's, let's run something. So they start working for this guy. Well, this Mexican mafia member hears about it. And he goes and confronts Conejo. And he's like, hey, wh what's this, bro? You know, you got, you know, one of your brothers is out there and he's got like four or five sureños out there underneath him. 
selling his dope. He's like, you know, we're not supposed to be getting down like that. And, you know, instead of Cornell saying, hey, brother, th there's not supposed to be no lines out here. There's not supposed to be no labels. What are you talking about? Nordaniel Sureños. I thought we were all Rasa out here. Instead of saying that, or instead of like, hey, I mean, come on, bro, let's 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 keep it real. These this guy, let me I'll talk to him, but I'm pretty sure he didn't twist their arms to sling dough for him. I'm pretty sure it's a symbiotic relationship. They're both, you know, they they they're both benefiting from that. So, but instead, Conejo was fast to burn somebody up and have him whacked, even one of his own brothers. Somebody like Knoppers, I think he was from Sacramento, that had been around for years. Knoppers had been back there in the shoe program. I was with him in D facility back in the early 90s, but he had been back there for years. Never debriefed, held his mud, stayed back there in the shoe for like 20-something years, got out, gets out there on the main line. He's out there programming with everybody else, and he goes out for something like this. It's mind-blowing, but it just goes to show you that, you know, a lot of these C's out there on both sides were real fast to burn somebody up or to have them whacked to eat their own, to, you know, to knock their own down just to prove to the other side that, hey, we're real over here about this, about this agreement to end hostilities. Anybody, you know, messes up on this side, they're getting knocked down. It doesn't matter how long they've been around, but they burn that brother up for for that reason there wasn't nothing else involved it was because these guys were selling his dope from what joker told me even those guys that were under him that were slinging and i'm i, I keep saying under him but they weren't really even under him they had an arrangement he was providing them with a little bit of clavo and they were slinging it and because of that he gets hit that's just crazy. I, I still can't wrap my head around something like that, especially you're talking about a C like knockers that, you know, I want to say he had like a, a at least a D number or something like that. He's somebody that had been around for years. His name was good. And then to get into a situation like that and go out over something as crazy as this, it's just, it's discouraging. I'm sure it had to be discouraging for a lot of you know, homeboys that were out there on the yard that seen that, but that's what they were doing. You know, they were fast to eat their own, you know, to cannibalize their own in order to, you know, appease the other side or to make the other side, you know, feel, you know, to earn points with these guys, man. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I, I know you guys, you know, were hoping that it would have been a big, a big old war out there on the yard and, and a bunch of kills and all that, but it wasn't about that. It could have led to that. A small incident like this right here could have escalated and it could have, you know, it could have turned into something like that. But you had some good leaders out there that handled it the way that they seen fit and they set a precedent, uh, at least on that yard. And that's what happened. You know, I don't know how long they stayed out there, but you know, that, that situation right there, it ended up getting resolved and somebody got made an example of, but it was because, you know, it was because of their own indiscretions. It wasn't like Chato just burnt him up because he disrespected an NF member. At least Chato gave him, you know, the benefit of the doubt to speak up and, you know, man up and take accountability for his own actions. So the lesson of the day is take accountability for your own actions. And if you can't be a good sport, if you can't show good sportsmanship, stay off the handball court and watch out for those kill shots. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I'll be back with, I hope, tomorrow. I didn't get a phone call today. They might be on lockdown. I don't know. Shit happens. Shit happens all the time. It's prison. Maybe I'll run the inner demons or a war story tomorrow. Who knows? But I'll run something. I'm still working on another profile. We're still continuing to do that. We're going to get some chapters out to you guys. And I'm going to run a live sometime in the next couple of days. It's been a minute since I jumped down and kicked it with you guys. Anyways, with that being said, this one right here is in the history books. I hope you guys enjoyed it, especially those of you that are Yankee fans. I'll be back with another one the next time I come on. Anyway, with that being said, you guys tap in. Let me know what you think about this situation right here. Some of you that might be familiar with it or another situation 
you know, things that escalate like that or the little things that can escalate like that, I'm sure a lot of you know that have been to prison that things like this can turn into full scale wars. Anyway, with that being said, this your boy B and I'm out. Anyways, with that being said, this your boy B and I'm out. <laughs>